Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Since I preached last, there's been many requests, but I'm going to preach anyway. <laughs> uh, one further announcement uh, Hugh has asked me to make that next Sunday, Ron Weeb will be preaching. And Ron, for those of you who haven't made his acquaintance yet, he's here today. And he and his wife are the directors of Child Evangelism Fellowship for Atlantic Canada, and we're honored to have them as members of our congregation. And so he'll be preaching next Sunday. We heard him at prayer meeting this past week as he talked about his work in Brazil. And uh, we pray that you'll, you'll uh, tell your friends. And then the following Sunday, there's a guy named uh, Nick Dunfield that's going to preach the after, Sunday after that. Uh, our scripture this morning is from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. And uh, I'm reading it from the, the New Revised Standard Version of the, of the Bible. You follow along with your Bible, or you have it on the, if it's on the screen, uh, and make the adjustment. Romans 5, 1 to 8. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. And then hear this verse. But God proves his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let's pray. Lord, I pray you'll take these ordinary words of mine this morning and make them into your words for our hearts and lives this day. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you stoned for life? I hope not. We want to talk about that this morning for, for a bit. You know, st stones are all through the scripture. I brought a sack of them this morning, as you heard me. We, it's all throughout the scripture we see it. Um, we planted our first garden in our new place this year with Gordon's help and others and uh, Jed's help. And I know one thing we can grow there is stones because I found a lot of them. And I don't know if you garden in the same plot all your life, if you ever get rid of all the stones. But stones seem to be in our fields all around us. But this morning, I want to talk about the stones that we carry through our life, through our lives. In the cartoon, Frank and Ernest are standing outside the Megacorp headquarters, and Frank says, I don't know what my birthstone is, but I was born on Labor Day, so I think it's the grindstone. <laughs> now, we all have birthstones. Um, I don't know if it, those of you who've been to Israel noted, but when you go to the cemeteries there, on top of the tombs of the people that are buried there, are stones, random stones, laying on top of the, the cemetery. And it always puzzled me as to why. And th there, there are a couple explanations as I found out as I researched a little bit. One is that it's a remembrance of your visit to the grave site because in, their, in the Jewish belief that they are literally there. They, they, they aren't in heaven anywhere, they're there. And uh, so you're paying your homage to that dead body that's there and you put a, leave a stone on top of the gravestone as a re remembrance that you were there. Another Jewish tale says that they're there, they keep the body in the grave. The more stones you put on top, the more chances the body will stay in the grave. It's unfortunate they don't know about Jesus and that uh, he comes to not leave us in that grave, but will take us to be with him if we know him and give us a new body. A woman was talking to her friends about her husband who had passed away recently and he made his death so, e so much easier for her. When he was on his deathbed, he told her that he had three envelopes in his desk drawer that would take care of all the arrangements. 
Shortly thereafter, the man died, so the wife opened the drawer, and there were the three envelopes, just like he said. The first envelope said, for the casket. There was $3,000 in the envelope, so she bought him a very nice casket. The second envelope said, for the expenses, and it had $5,000 in it, so she paid all the bills after the fun funeral. The third envelope said, for the stone, it had $6,000 in it. So she held out her hand to her friend and said, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> you know, in the, in the Old Testament, we find all kinds of references to stones. Um, Joshua instructed the leaders of Israel to choose 12 men when they went across the, the Jordan with the Ark of the Covenant to go out to the middle of the river where the water had parted and get a stone, each 12 stones, and then to set up a, a monument of that significant event in their lives where God intervened and allowed them to cross that water with the Ark of the Covenant and the people. And uh, that happened at, at Gilgal. And the stone is there to show the, their children to remind their children of what happened in the history of their, their coming out of Egypt and into the promised land. And then in 1 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 12, Samuel, after the battle, the Philistines set up, set up large stone between Mizpah and Shem and named it Ebenezer. As a kid growing up in church, when we sing that song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, the second verse, it says, Here I raise my Ebenezer. I thought Ebenezer was an old man's name as a kid, and just had to learn that it wasn't. It, Ebenezer means, hither by thy help I've come. In other words, I've got this far by faith, by trusting in you, Lord. That's my Ebenezer. In Acts chapter 4, verses 8 to 12, when Peter preached to the Jewish leaders, he quoted Psalm 118, verse 22, to share that the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone or the cornerstone. Jesus is a rejected stone who God made to be the sent cornerstone of our salvation. And he pressed the point home when he said in his powerful conclusion in verse 12 of Acts chapter 4, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. There is no hope, no other way, no other name in the name of Jesus. And then in 1 Peter 2.15, he goes on, he says, you yourselves are like living stones, are built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. Today I want to talk to you about something we each have. You see, we, do, we all do have one. Oh, you may not remember receiving it, but we've got it. It was part of our package at birth. Nobody else can see it except the strain they see in our eyes and the, the doubt on our face and the troubled look that we give sometimes. We can't even see it if we look in the mirror. We might be able to see the strain that it causes, but we can't see this thing any more than anyone else can. You see, we all have one, and we're not even aware of it. Some are bigger than others. Some are small. You didn't ask for it. it. It just came. You might not remember seeing it, but you felt it. It's heavy, and it weighs you down wherever you go. What am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about your sack of stones that you carry around with you through life. It weighs you down. So why do we need it? It's not a grindstone or even a precious stone. We need to carry stones to, we picked up along our way in life. Stones of all sizes, all shapes, pebbles, boulders, some small, some huge, some smooth and shiny, some rough with rough edges, jagged edges. Some you pick up willingly, some you didn't ask for at all. Some were just tossed in your direction and stuck like cling wrap to cheese or lint to a black wool suit. 
In the movie With Honors, starring Joe Pesci and Brendan Fraser, there's a wonderful scene. The main character, Simon Wilder, is a homeless man, slowly dying of asbestos poisoning. He's reluctantly befriended by Montgomery or Monty Kessler, a law student at Harvard. In one of their conversations, Simon pulls out a leather pouch filled with stones and says, there it is, that's my life. Simon dumps them out of his hand and picks one up the stone and says, I picked this one up in Bali, one of the best night's sleep I ever had. And Monty says, you remember one night of sleep? Simon says, last good one I've had. Monty looks at all the stones and says, what's this shiny one? Oh, he says, that's a woman, the right one. Yep, each stone tells a story that I want to remember. All I do is put them in my hand and I rub them and abracadabra, I'm right back there to where it took place. So Simon puts all the stones back in the, in the pouch. And as they walk on, Monty says, tell me about that woman. Simon says, I can't, I'm not holding the stone. You see, there's memorial stones and memory stones and stones like the one in front of the tomb of Jesus. As those ladies said on Easter Sunday morning, who will move a stone for us? Stones that keep us from getting to Jesus. Like Simon, we all have a pouch or a sack or a backpack full of stones and rocks that we've collected over the years. We not be able to remember what they represent even until we hold them in our hands, but we feel the weight and the burden of them every step along life's journey. I just want to mention a few of those stones this morning. There's the stone of rejection. Some of the stones we carry are stones of rejection. You were given one the time you didn't make the team. When they played that pickup game of baseball or softball, and they always chose teams before they played, and they threw one person the bat, and then they hand over hand, and then they'd see who got first pick, and you were always the last one picked. And you said it didn't bother you, but it did. You felt rejected that you didn't matter, or that you had no skills. Why would they choose you last every time? It wasn't because you didn't practice, because you did. You wanted to be a good ball player. That's all you did for weeks. You thought you were good enough, but the coach didn't. You thought you were good enough, but they said you weren't. You don't have to live very long before you get a sack full of stones, make a bad grade, make a poor choice, make a mess, get called a few names. Whoever said sticks and stones will break your bones, but names will never hurt you, didn't know what they were talking about. They didn't know what it was like to be made fun of because you were overweight or because you were blonde or because you were redheaded smart or slow or skinny or uncoordinated or a jock or maybe because of your color. Every name you were ever called added a stone to your sack. And the stones don't stop collecting with graduation or adulthood. Unfortunately, they keep coming. I know a man who had a, hasn't had a job in two years. All he wants is a decent job so he can care for his family and not lose his house. But he's either overqualified or doesn't have the skills they're looking for or wants too much money or they can't pay him what he's worth. Every rejection dumps another stone into his bag. Stones of rejection. We all get them and they're heavy. Even those folks who seem to have it all together, they get them too. And what they lead to sometimes is those stones of rejection lead to stones of inadequacy. Don't try. Don't put ourselves in situations where we'll feel inadequate. I know growing up in my family, my father was a Finnish carpenter, good carpenter. When I would try to help him, I would always bring him the wrong tool or it wasn't the right board. I'd bend the nails over when I pounded them in. And I got so that I didn't feel I could do it right because he was constantly telling me that I didn't do it right. 
So to this day, it's hard for me to take on anything that involves carpentry skills or anything that I'm, I know I can't do ahead of time. I really have to think about it. Oh, there are things that I can do. I'm sure that if I asked you to come up and preach this morning, you might feel a little inadequate. And, and, uh, but things like that, why someone asked me this morning if I was going to get in trouble with Joyce this morning. I'm going to try not to. But, <laughs> but uh, in our family, Joyce is the one that does the, 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 the work. Joyce, one time we had an old Aerostar van and needed body work. Well, Joyce... Joyce, I wouldn't dare touch anything like that because I felt inadequate that I couldn't do it right. And I'd have to take it to Hugh or to, to Tim or somebody to fix it for me. And um, uh, Joyce went to Canadian Tire. She bought some resin and some tape and get, went to the library and got a book on doing body work. And she did the body work in that car <laughs> without a thought. And she did an adequate job, but it lasted us another two years before it all, the body fell, all fell out. But... <laughs> And we, we gave the van to a friend who, who needed it worse than we did. You know, so there are those stones of rejection that leads to stone, uh, stones of inadequate. Just uh, say his name, and most Christian readers will know who you're talking about. In fact, they've probably read at least one of his books. His book sales are exceeded only by the likes of Billy Graham and Charles Swindoll. Max Lucado has a last name many people struggle to correctly pronounce, but they sure know who he is and that they love his books. When his book, God Whispers Your Name, was named the top-selling book of 1994, Word Publishing Company considers the book to be successful when a -time, first-time author reaches 50,000 copies and an established author sells 100,000 copies. But each of Lucado's 14 books have sold more than 300,000 copies. He hasn't always, it hasn't always been that way for that Church of Christ minister. In 1985, he put his first book together while serving as a missionary in Brazil. That book, On the Advil, On the Anvil, Thoughts of Being Shaped into God's Image, was rejected by 15 publishers. What a treasure the world would have missed if he had given up on writing just because he felt rejection. Stones of rejection, we all get them. They're heavy. They weigh us down. Another stone in our sack often is stones of regret. If you look in the sack, you'll see more than one kind of stones. Regrets for losing your temper. Regrets for losing control. Regrets for the job that you should have done and didn't do. Regrets for the words you should have spoken in someone else's defense, but you let slip by. Regrets for the malice gossip you started about a friend. Regrets for harsh words you had with whoever was in the way that night. Regret for a misspent youth. I don't know if it's still around or not, but I remember reading about a new uh, 900 phone number. It's called Mr. Apology. Some clever capitalist has figured out how to make a buck off our regrets and our sense of guilt. The story said that Mr. Apology gets over 100 phone calls a day. What people do is they leave their anonymous apology on the system's answering machine. You can leave your apology and, or listen to other people's apologies about whatever you're having to deal with the real damage you did to another human being. You can dump that garbage without any real accountability. Of course, it costs something to do it. It's a whole lot different than what the scripture says we should do, but it does point to the whole idea of regret. Stones of regret build up. One guilty deed, one stone of regret. It's not long before that sack gets heavy and we get tired. How can you dream about the future when you're worn out from carrying the weight of your past? No wonder some folks look so tired and miserable all the time. They're loaded down with stones of regret. And then there's another stone I'd like to speak briefly about this morning, and that's the stone of judgment. A Sunday school teacher told a class the story of David and Goliath with great detail and lots of gestures, like Nick does when he tells children's stories. 
She told how little David killed Goliath with a rock from his slingshot. At the end of the story, she asked the class what lesson they had learned. One of the little boys popped up and he said, duck. (laughs) That's what you want to do sometimes, isn't it? Someone once said, watch how you walk through life. Everybody else is watching how you walk through life. We don't like to be judged, do we? And whether we like it or not, we're judged all the time. Take a position of leadership in the church, pastor, Sunday school teacher, a deacon, whatever. People won't like everything you do, and you'll be judged. Now, they may not tell you to your face, but they may murmur it behind your back. But we can feel it sometimes in our relationships with them. We don't like to be judged. It leads us right to the most important stone of all, the first stone. Remember Jesus said, let who is ever without sin cast the first stone. I know a pastor who has a stone sitting on his desk. It's mounted on a little stand. It's engraved with the words, the first stone. It reminds him not to be judgmental. You see, we know the burdens. Of, we all know the burden of judgment stones. We've all ducked as someone chucked one of those judgment stones at us. Sometimes we've been so hit so hard by their judgment stone, it hurts and it scars us inside. Often those judgment stones are passed on to others by them who don't even know us. This past uh, week, I uh, had an encounter with a man in a church uh, in, in the area here who knew me back in, in the 70s and 80s. And for a couple of reasons in my life, he, he made some judgments on me. And he never talked to me about it, but I felt them. I felt that our relationship changed. He was more distant. He didn't talk to me unless I initiated the conversation. And uh, Joyce and I were at a gathering, ministering uh, this past week, and uh, he was there. And uh, his wife is usually very friendly, but he just is kind of standoffish, and he didn't used to be standoffish. And I felt judgment from him. And as we sang and ministered, the judgment started to melt away. And uh, he came up after and put his arm around me. And he said, he didn't say anything. He just said, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you did today. Now, I didn't talk about the judgment. He didn't talk about the judgment. But it's going to be different from now on when I'm with him. It's important. But we've all fooled ourselves. None of us are without sin. We've all been over and picked up that first stone and joyfully tossed it at others. The problem with judgment stones, the problems with first stones, is that every time we cast a judgment stone, it's like pointing your finger at someone. There's three fingers pointing back at you. Every judgment stone we cast is a multiplying boomerang stick, a blur effect, because for every one we tossed, at least four more get hurled back, land in our sack, and weigh us down even more. We know about judgment stones. They hurt. They're a heavy burden to bear. What do we do with this stack full of stones that we carry around with us? It slows us down wherever we go, but we still carry it. We work harder and harder trying to forget about the sack, trying to make ourselves think it doesn't exist, that we're okay. We pour ourselves into our jobs and our hobbies, our studies. We can't pour out the stones. We can't. Instead, we get involved in a lot of activities. People will think we're great if we do a lot of activities. We, get, we might get so caught up in the activity or good deed that we lay the burdens down for a while. But then we turn to head home. There's the sack in our path. We can't leave without it. Sometimes we drag it off to a counselor. And he or she, if she, he or she gives good counsel, we're, we're even, we lay them all out in front of the counselor and on the floor and we look at them and we name them and we describe them and we even relive some of them. The counselor listens and she, he or she gives good counsel, sometimes we're even able to leave one of the two stones behind 
and that's good. But generally, we lean over and scoop up all the stones, put them back in our sack, hoist it on our shoulders, and continue to carry those burdens with us. Some folks even bring their stack of stones to church, like I did this morning. And they, thinking that religion might help. Sometimes all the church does is add more stones by playing on our guilt. No, I'm not saying this church does anything like that, but sometimes there's so many rules we can't keep up with them or telling us how we have to dress or look or speak or sit or do this or not do that before we can be really a real Christian whose sins are forgiven and the sack just gets heavier. In order for us to move forward in our lives, to receive the blessing God has for us, these stones need to be dealt with in our lives. In Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. He doesn't want us burdened by all this garbage. He doesn't want us wandering around making a smelly mess of our lives and, and the world. He didn't give us 14 positive ways to know God better. He didn't give us scriptural principles for health and happiness. But what he did give us was an invitation. If you're tired and need rest from the struggles of life, Jesus says, come to me. If you're tired of the stink of sin in your life, Jesus says, come to me. If your sack is filled with stones of rejection, stones of regret, and stones of judgment, and the load is too heavy for you to carry a step further, Jesus says, come to me. You see, Jesus invites us to come to him, to open up our sack and pour out all the stones that weigh us down at the foot of the cross. Jesus poured himself out for us so that we might pour out our sack and know the joy of forgiveness and the inner peace which is promised. That inner peace of being justified through faith. Do you know what justified means? In printer's terms, it means lining the straight edges of both sides of the pages so they're justified and are together. No ragged edges. Newspapers use justification when they print the paper. In other terms, to justify means to make it right. Let me explain it this way. He says when we dump all our sins, all those regrets and rejections and judgments and all the stuff that stinks in our lives at the foot of the cross, then God looks at us just as if we'd never done any of that stuff. Just as if I'd never done any of that stuff. As we deal with these stones in our lives, I want to bring these stones over this morning to the foot of the cross. And I want to dump them out here. Now, usually as we go through life, we just, it's pretty hard to dump them out all at once because some we're not even aware of, you know. But when, when we are aware of them and we've dealt with them, we've, we've given them to the Lord, we've come to him for our answer, we can lay them at the foot of the cross where he paid the penalty for those things in our lives. And then, then it, it doesn't usually happen that all our stones are dealt with. The stones that we know about, that God has shown us, that we need to get right with him, that God may be showing you this morning some things you need to get right with him that you've carried far too long. Reminds me of a lady in our church in Ontario that when I got there, she and I went to visit her for the first time, she told me about her little toddler boy, two, or two years old, that she was bathing in one of those old stainless steel wash tubs. And she had to filled with water and he was in the tub and she turned her back to go get a towel or something and he drowned in the tub. And that, the hurt of that, she's been carrying ever since and that was 40 years ago. 
And she's still carrying that, carrying that guilt that she, of what happened to, the, to her little boy. And some of us carry guilts of divorces, separations, past sins that in our lives we carry them with us and we, we hold them against ourselves. God will, and it, they're burdens, they're stones that weigh us down. And God wants us to be free of that. So God will continue to show you things in your life that you need to make right with him as a Christian. It isn't just coming to Jesus and everything will be okay. It's, it's asking the Lord to show you, what do I need to deal with in my life? I didn't get that at first. At first I thought I was, I, I was not aware that God was showing me things that I needed to have changed by him. I was trying to live my life for Christ without being honest with him. I was, as I started, I brought all the stones I was aware of, but there were more that I wasn't aware of. And then I did a dangerous thing. I asked God to reveal them to me. And he did. He did. It's like standing in front of the bathroom mirror in the morning, you know, and you're there in front of the mirror and there's usually a light over the mirror. You know, the closer you get to the light, the more you see the pock marks and the blemishes and the things that need to be dealt with in our lives. The closer we get to Jesus, the more we see those things that we need to deal with. So it's not a one-time shot. We receive salvation when we come to the Lord, but he then begins to work and clean, help us clean up our lives so that we can serve him better and be in perfect communion with him as time goes on. That process is called sanctification. Now, I don't want to get into an argument with you from the Wesleyan point of view this morning about that, but God is forever sanctifying us and changing us to make him more like himself. And, uh, and God will continue to show you those stones. Even though I wasn't perfect, and I'm not perfect even today, right, Joyce? <laughs> I'm able to bring my stones to him because he showed me that he loved me the way I was. But he didn't want to leave me that way. He wanted to make me more like him. And the only way we know that peace is through emptying our sack, our sack, as we're aware of it. God proves his love for us. And the last verse of the scripture I chose for today is the last verse I want to focus on. God proves his love for us in the while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. I, some people feel they can't come to God because they're not good enough. Well, it's like going fishing. When you catch a fish, their fish is caught. God doesn't clean them before you catch them. He catches them first, and then, then he cleans them. And God's about that in our lives, cleaning us of the things he needs to clean for us. Do you really hear that? God proves his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came to offer himself up for each of us before we ever heard about him. Jesus came for us while we were still separated from God. Jesus came for us while we were still alone and cut off, while we were still rebellious. It cost him his life, but he came anyways. That's how much God loves us. And through his life, Jesus offers us forgiveness and new life and inner peace. He came to offer us justification and salvation from the consequences of our sin. All we need to do is have faith in him and be honest before him. So I would ask you to take time today to look inward if there's things you need to deal with and you need help with that, to come for prayer at the end of the service. Speak with somebody in confidence. They're not going to blab it all over the community. Whatever it is, maybe something you just need to deal with yourself. But open yourself up. Pour out those stones of rejection, rejection and regret and judgment and denial, resentment, jealousy, anxiety, anger, abuse, all those other burdensome stones you're carrying through your life and not, may not have been aware of it. Empty them out and leave at the foot of the cross and leave the sack behind. Are you stoned for life? I hope not. Or just a stack of stones, but you've been justified both by faith in Christ. Your sins have been forgiven. You don't need to carry that burdensome sack of shame and guilt anymore. There's no stone 
that is too hard for Jesus to roll away. No stone. Just call on him to show you what stones you're holding in your life that keeps you from being all you could be for him. And then leave them with him. Don't pick them up again after you've left them with them, but leave them with them. And know that you've been forgiven, that you, those hurts are healed. Actual authority in your life that need to be changed or changed. That's God's word for us this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, we don't know how to thank you for everything you've done for us. We pray that you'll continue to work with us as sinful people, that you'll continue to show us your ways, help us to be honest before you, and to come to you when you do convict us of things in our lives that need to be straightened out. We know you're the great healer, you're the great physician. You invite us to come to you. This is our prayer today, that we'll keep short accounts with you come to you as you call us to yourself. Let us pray. Amen.